Join us, friends. Great Scott, spot guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, spot guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, friends. This is the spa guy. And I'm glow trotting with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey. And let me explain. This is a history style podcast. And the idea behind this podcast is that we love history. Don't you love history, Trey? I love history. Real history. We love all kinds of history. Music history, uh, American history, war history, movie history. I love movie history, don't you? Oh, I, love- I love going to places where movies happen at and seeing what it looks like today. We love that kind of stuff. So Wishing Cotton Was a Monkey is actually a scene from The Little Rascals where uh, Spanky is sitting there and he's got his friend Cotton sitting next to him and this monkey has escaped. I think he escaped the carnival from my memory. And the monkey is actually behind Cotton up on top of this thing and he has this explosive. And Spanky wants a monkey instead of Cotton. Okay, so he keeps saying, I sure do wish Cotton was a monkey. I sure do wish Cotton was a monkey. Well, he hears this explosion, and what happened was the the monkey actually lit an explosive and threw it, and when he did, it scared Cotton. Cotton ran off. The monkey jumped down in Cotton's place, so when Spanky opened his eyes and looked, there was Cotton in his place. Wow. That's where this saying comes from, wishing Cotton was a monkey. What that is about, it's an analogy for the accuracy of history. And what I mean by that is there in history, there are things that actually happened a certain way, and it happened that way. That's really what happened. Then there's the history of a person's recollection, which a lot of times we have found and Trey and I have been doing this a long time, interviewed a lot of people, but we found that people's memories of things are not always as accurate as they believe that they are. A lot of times they actually write themselves into the story to make themselves the hero of the, of the story would be one way. Another thing is they will modify the story to put themselves in the story and they were not actually really there, or they'll completely fabricate a story, but they really believe that it's true, or they'll just straight out lie about the story. (laughs) Okay, so there's all these scenarios and we're fascinated by the history. And whenever you're interviewing people and learning about history and talking and trying to decide what's real and what's not real, it's, it's actually become somewhat of a, uh, of a psychological uh, uh, study, if you will, of the human condition where they have issues, in a lot of cases, being truthful. But there's also cases where I believe that the person believes that their memory is correct and it's just not. And I've actually experienced that and I will give you an example. Um, I did uh, a study about, this would have been in Tupelo, Mississippi, and it was about a house that Elvis Presley lived at on 1414, or actually I'm telling you wrong, on 1010 North Green. And that particular house has been told for years and years and years that it was at a certain place on North Green. Well, it turns out that the house was further down on North Green, actually across a big highway. There's a bridge there now where they dug a highway in and you have to cross a bridge that's between the the two addresses, if you will. But if you go by today's address, that little house falls under 1010 North Green. But after they enacted some of the, uh, a lot of times it was the 911 stuff that got them to regulate and fix addresses, which changed all the addresses on streets. That's a lot of it. Um, But there's other factors, other things that could cause that. So I'll tell you all that to tell you this. The thing that happened to me was uh, I went through an issue where somebody was calling me out saying that where I said that the house was in a video was actually not where it was. Well, the problem is, is the person that was saying that to me 
was about two years old when Elvis Presley lived in that house. The person that told me where the house was was actually a childhood friend of Elvis at the time that actually lived there. It was his grandfather's farm. So that person grew up there. And so if anybody would know where things were, that person would know. But it was funny to me that the, that the, the person that was um, uh, two years old, if you will, or so, when Elvis would have lived there, was standing me down that I was wrong. But anyway, that, that is really not part of the story, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a backstory. But the, the, real, the reality of it is, is when I was studying it again to be sure that I got it right, in my mind, I was telling someone where that other house was, the one that was wrong that I have photographs of that's actually gone now. And in my mind, I told that person, now keep in mind, I spent days studying this at one time, going to Tupelo, going to this street, studying Google Maps, studying historic aerials, studying all these different pieces. Standing there. And physically standing there, that's right. And I told that person when, when I was discussing that, I was discussing it with the guy that had photographs of the wrong house that was saying, no, this is where they told me. And, and so I was telling him that house was to the left of a, it was here on, on North Green. There was a school beside it. And so I was sure that I was exactly right. I could see it in my mind. And keep in mind that, that me studying that happened less than two years before I was having this conversation that I'm describing to you. So I go back to historic aerials and I go back to my videos and I start looking. It actually turns out that the house was on the other side of this thing that I was calling a school and it was actually a church. Wow. So, so you see how easily, look guys, I studied it for accuracy. I thought I had it in my mind exactly right and I didn't. And that was something that, that, in my mind, I would have sworn that I had it right, but I didn't. So that's part of the human condition. So Trey's and my job is when we're going out and filming stuff, and we film, uh, to give you a little background, we have focused a lot on Elvis Presley, but we also do other historic figures. We do have done Marilyn Monroe, uh, Frank Sinatra, James Dean, um, the Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch. Um, we've done the Andy Griffith Show. We've done uh, uh, Bruce Lee. We've done all these different historic characters and people that we're fascinated with. And we try our best to get this stuff right, but we also try our best to prove that a story that's told about someone is truthful or not truthful. Can you think of an example, Trey, of, uh, of a story that we, uh, that we thought was one way and it turned out to be another way? Can you think of an example? Mm. I, I guess what's coming to mind just without me really thinking about is, is the UNLV. Viva okay. La That's a great example. Even the Las Vegas stage where Elvis and Ann Margaret did that awesome iconic scene. You thought it's at UNLV cause they say it's at UNLV and they still report that it's at UNLV, but spy guy, tell them where it's really at because you and I stood there. It's really in Culver City, across the street from the movie studio in Memorial Auditorium. And it looks exactly like it did. When was that, 67? 67, 67 19, yes. Okay, Viva Las Vegas was 67. That stage today, when we, me and you filmed that, was it 2019? 18. Yeah, 2018? 19. I think it was 2019. Yeah, 2019. When we were there in 2019, it looked almost identical to the way it looked in 1967. The basketball court was the same. They've added a three-point line, of course, but the, the original court is still there that's in that movie with Elvis. The stage has not changed. I mean, that that same little uh, microphone plug-ins, just like it was, you can tell. Right on the front of the stage, yeah. You know, because Elvis and Ann Margaret fall down on the stage at the end of that scene. And you, you actually reenacted that. I that video is actually on my channel, on the Spy Guy channel. And let me tell you this, uh, for all of you people, this is more of a listening thing. This is a podcast. That's the point of it is listening. Trey and I do visual stuff. We do videos with audio. So we're having to kind of train our mind when we're doing these podcasts that you're not going to see the things that we're talking about. But if you want to go see these things, unless you happen to be watching this on YouTube, 
But if you want to go see what we're talking about, go to my channel, The Spa Guy, on YouTube and search Spa Guy and Viva Las Vegas, UNLV. Okay. And uh, if you do that, you we actually got to go in there and even somewhat reenact some of the things that happened in there. But I actually went to UNLV in Las Vegas, as you mentioned, and they still believe that it happened there. Mm -hmm. And they even printed, there's stories in the newspaper in Las Vegas that it happened there, and it didn't. We've proven that it didn't, yeah. but it's still being reported that it happened at UNLV. They need to watch the spa guy. They need to watch That's the right. spa guy. But, but uh, I physically went there to UNLV to the gymnasium. And you, I, I think I remember watching that episode of yours and you walked all around the building, you were looking up in the rafters and you were, it, it, your mind was telling you, none of this adds up. Nothing in this building adds up. I, Cause I remember you talking about that on the show. Yeah. Well, there's no way when you look at something, the way something's built, you, I have the ability. Um, and most people I would think would have the ability to look at something and go, you know, it's been modified. A door's been moved. This has happened. That's happened. But the, the two things that stood out to me is UNLV, the stage, the gymnasium floor, there is no stage. It's just a gymnasium floor. In uh, Culver City at Memorial Auditorium, there's a gymnasium, and then there's a uh, stage that's, what, two and a half, three feet off the ground that is featured in the movie. And another thing that was featured in the movie that always kind of caught my eye was when you're looking from Elvis's vantage point out to the gymnasium where Ann Margaret is down there dancing and all the other people are dancing. And I think, by the way, one of those girls dancing was Terry Garve, too. Um, I believe she was one of the dancing girls. Don't, don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, I know she was in some scenes in some of the movies, and I think she was in that scene. But it looks really odd behind Ann up high up there but what it was, was there's a balcony and they took lights in, in the movie and shined them up, which kind of made an array back there. And so it looks, it, it's just, I couldn't, when I was watching the movie, I couldn't understand what that was. But that's why we go there, guys, so we can see what it is. You've got a lot of these, uh, we call them keyboard warriors, that sit home and try to make history videos and guys, you, there's some things you're never going to figure out till you drive somewhere and get out of your vehicle with the camera and start filming. In fact, there's many times that Trey and I go film together. That night, after we film something, we go back to the hotel room and study what we filmed that day. And I go, Trey, we didn't get it right, man. We go back the next morning and do it again. How many times do you think we've done that, Trey? Oh, multiple times. But man, that just shows like we care about making sure this stuff is correct before we put it out on YouTube because we're going to correct ourselves. And and we have done that on multiple videos. Me on my uh, Glow Trotting with Trey, you on the Spa Guy. But it's because we care about this true history of Elvis, of James Dean, of Clark Gable, of any person that we're doing the Elvis, I call it the, uh, I'm giving the Elvis effect, the, uh, the, the Elvis Treatment. Treatment is what I, I say, say. I couldn't even remember because y'all got it's pressure here, guys. I'm live, you know. But the Elvis treatment is what I call it. And we just want to dig in and make sure, guys, we are delivering a as accurate as we can without being there story of a real person's life. Because that person deserves it. And what I'm saying is Elvis deserves accuracy. Dean uh uh James Dean Excellent. deserves it. Marilyn Monroe deserves it. Frank Sinatra deserves it. These people's legacy is important. And a lot of times a person's legacy is actually tarnished because somebody lied about that person. And back in the day, you couldn't Google and find out if it's true. Nowadays, there's no reason for people to be spreading lies and rumors because a lot of times you could Google and find out, especially if it's hard facts. So let's talk about that for just a moment. There's a such thing as hard facts in history, such as uh, we know that uh, that December the 8th, uh, was it uh, 1944, uh, the, that Pearl Harbor happened, right? Was it 44? Yes. Am I remembering that right? Uh, hey, I'll have to make sure, guys. Okay, so Google that. I think that it was December the 8th, 1944. Like but it. the day that lives in infamy. So that is a hard fact. Now, if you wanted to speculate 
Yeah. Hey, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> December 7th, 1941. Okay. <laughs> you see? <laughs> oh, geez, my guy, you put it three years later and you got it all wrong. <laughs> right. But actually, it was not at the end of the war where I just put it. Yeah, you it was at the beginning. That was what caused the war, right? Spa guy, you were bossing it. You were bossing <laughs> this story, so don't do that. Yeah. So yeah. my point with all that is, is that's something that you can simply look up. You don't have to take a person's word for that. You've got a phone. Google it and see if what they said is accurate. But there's other things that you may or may not know are accurate. Um, for instance, why? they attacked Pearl Harbor could be speculative. That's not a necessarily a hard fact. It depends on whether you're looking at it from the Japanese standpoint or the German standpoint or the American standpoint. All those things play into it. And by the way, for those of you that love history, I'll give you a little history tidbit since we're talking about Pearl Harbor. Trey, do you know that the very first person that took enemy fire in Pearl Harbor was not a military aircraft. Do you know who it was and what it was? I don't. Okay, so if you watch the movie Pearl Harbor, you'll see this scene. They never sh talk about the person. They just show a private airplane taking enemy fire. And who that was was actually a lady, a girl named Cornelia Fork. I've Cornelia heard Fork was from Nashville. I did a story on Cornelia. She was from Nashville, and she became a pilot and she was in Hawaii teaching flight lessons when the zeros came in to Pearl Harbor and fired on her plane. And she um, uh, uh, also went on to join the WASPs and she actually died in a military aircraft. I, I believe, I'm pretty sure that what I'm going to tell you is accurate, but you can Google it. She was the first female to die in in military service. And she actually, two airplanes collided, a man and her, in midair, and she died uh, from that collision. But she was actually from Nashville, and there's an airport here called the Cornelia Fork Airport, which got flooded in the floods uh, in Nashville, I think from my memory in 2011 was when I believe the floods were. And it the airport went underwater. And that particular airport, um, is now a city park and you can go down there and actually walk or ride your bicycle on the runways. Okay. And I actually knew a guy that lived there. His name was uh, Russell brothers and he lived, I worked on his hot tub because he lived in a double wide trailer on the, uh, uh, on the landing strip. This, this was a double wide trailer that was literally on the landing strip that had a hot tub between the trailer and the, and the, uh, uh, uh the airstrip. And I would go there and work on his hot tub. Very interesting guy, Russell Brothers. And we'll we'll do a story about Russell Brothers. I've done. I've got some of those stories on my channels as well uh, about Russell, about Cornelia Fork. There's just I'm just fascinated by history. I am too, but I would like to see this uh, hot tub there <laughs> in between the runway. Of well, the now it's all gone, sadly. But I okay. did. I would go out there and work on that hot tub because when it got flooded, of course, it destroyed the trailer, so they tore all that stuff down. But uh, Russell was, uh, uh, and I don't know how we got on this, but we got on Cornelia Fork. Russell was a very interesting character um, because he got in trouble for smuggling things in the airplane. Oh. And after the park after the airport became a park, he crash landed his airplane there again okay. and got in trouble again. And I'm not sure, it wasn't even an airport anymore and he still landed there and ended up crashing his airplane. He didn't hurt himself, but the police came up. You could find the story that I'm talking about. That's uh, uh, that. what I'm saying is not me just uh, talking out of school. That's a real story. You know, you can find the newspaper uh, stuff about it. And uh, he did some jail time. Just quite a very interesting character. And well, I, I just love people like that. Well, you know, back to like the Pearl Harbor thing. And, and yeah, because I, I watched that movie. Uh, they, I remember in high school, we watched that movie in class and stuff. So now when you, you know, you see these movies on Elvis and things and you watch the, me watch the film and I'm like, that didn't happen. 
that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Who is that friend? That didn't happen. So now I'm questioning all these movies that you watch because you believe, I believe the Pearl Harbor story of that movie, you know, and, and I'm hoping that they didn't make a lot of that stuff up. I think I would speculate that a good portion of it's made up, but they, but they, what they did was they created a love story and then did Pearl Harbor around the love story. And I understand that. Yeah. That is different though than creating a story. Uh, and let's get back. You mentioned Baz before you were talking about something being Baz. And what he's talking about is the, the latest Elvis movie, which is called Elvis. And it is based off of Elvis's life is like, I, I'm being, I'm being very, 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 very forgiving. If I say that it's 20% accurate. And there's just so much of that that's not even close to what really happened. And that's what we're talking about. But see, people watch that and they trust that those people did their homework. That's why it's up to us to do our homework. That doesn't mean we get it right 100% of the time. A lot of times when we get it wrong, we're trusting a fact that someone told us that we cannot trust. That happens a lot. And then you go and find out, well, then what do you do? Uh, so let's talk about this for a second. What do you do if you get in a situation where you've got five people telling the story and there's two different versions of it? Okay. So three of the versions are one way, two of them are the other way. So then what I would start doing is I would do, uh, I would form a hypothesis based off of several things how well these five people knew the person or how close they were to the event, um, what they had to gain or lose by, by lying or telling the truth. So there's all that kind of stuff. So while we're talking about that, let's talk about MBE. Is it a good point to bring up MBE? Yeah, look, you need okay. to explain that. <laughs> okay, so we might as well start with this uh, in this podcast because this is the very first podcast that Trey and I have ever done. Uh, and so in the future, when you're listening to podcasts, if I say the, if I say this person is clearly MBE, I want you to understand what I'm saying. And what it is, is this, there's a, uh, a, a mental illness or sickness, if you will, that is called Munchausen. Some people will pronounce it different ways, but it's uh, Munchausen, Munchausen, whatever you want to call it. And that is when a person pretends that they are sick or for attention or for money. Then there's Munchausen by proxy, where that person pretends that a loved one is sick, a lot of times a child, for attention or money. Like they'll pretend that their child has cancer to raise money wow. or to get attention, that kind of stuff. It's called Munchausen by proxy. I coined the phrase Munchausen by Elvis. And what that is, is people that pretended like they knew Elvis or were actually in a story. And a lot of times they were never there or they were not as much a part of the story as they made themselves be. And there's people that are so MBE that like there's a book out from this. Uh, it's a female and 98 percent of the stuff that she wrote in that book is just total fabrication. But she's been heralded by the by the community of Elvis people as this you know so and I'm not going to call her out in this but uh but that all of this blows my mind there's people guys that literally make up stories to pretend like that they know Burt Reynolds you know I'll give you an example there's a guy that after Burt Reynolds died started posting all of these things about him and Burt Reynolds hanging out if you're listening to this, dude, you didn't hang out with Burt Reynolds. You're full of it. Yeah. That, you know, guy's, there's, that guy's on his invisible airplane as we record this. He Fly. claims he's got an airplane. He's he's flying around in Wonder Woman's airplane. But, yeah. but anyway, Listen. I don't want to get off on that craziness. But my point to this whole thing is, is when I was growing up and reading history books, and I'm sure you were the same way, Trey, nobody told me, hey, the accuracy of this book is up to the person that wrote it, how much they value truth. Yep. If they didn't value truth, then and, and, and it's that, the truth is up in the air. And that's a great thing that you said, value truth. 
And, and now I, I question everything. Like when you pull over on the side of the road and see a marker, I question everything that's on that because I've seen markers that is totally not true. What they have to. And then markers, they put markers in the wrong place. Important history. Why is the marker not where the actual story took place? If it's if it's in 50 feet of the thing, why is it not where it took place? And why is it 50 feet that way? I don't like that kind of stuff, you know? I don't either. But Trey, that also has to do with, and I'm talking a lot, so I'm going to let you talk a little bit. Um, but it also has to do with who is the person that wanted that marker there? Are they wanting that marker to make their property more valuable? So they're pretending like a person was there that was never there. Are they wanting that marker to uh, to have some kind of a historic significance for themselves? What is the motivation of that person? So guys, question every question us when you watch something that we did. Question it. Google it. Start learning about the story. If you want to know, if you value the truth and you want to know what happened which I want to know what happened. Trey wants to know what happened. If we didn't, we wouldn't care what people said. But if you value the truth, spend some time looking to see if the person that you're getting that story from has an agenda, uh, is Munchausen by whatever, um, is mental. You know, there's all these different reasons why a person would would lie about history and if you start with the basics and what i mean basics if you start with the hard history dates and times things that can't be finagled with usually um and they're getting those things wrong i wouldn't listen to another thing that they're saying well focus well, on go one ahead thing to point out uh, billy is with when, when some of these books were written 1979 1980, 1985, 1990. There was no internet. So these people were able to write these stories, put themselves in all these kind of stories, and they didn't think about someone like the spy guy or glow trotting with Trey 25, 28, 31 years later that's going to read these stories, and then they're going to really delve into this research and find out wait a moment, your dates don't line up. And that person wasn't there at that point in your story. And we have a flight book from a pilot that puts a certain individual at a certain place because the pilot recorded it when they flew into the town and he's not there where that story took place. So, so you see, they didn't think of the internet and they didn't think of to. I guess guys like you and I riding around the country in a gray ghost, <laughs> you know. Two knuckleheads. They never thought that there would be Google. Guys, we could go and pull up newspaper articles 100 years ago. We could pull up uh, 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 census records. We could pull up marriage licenses. We could pull up all these records, all these things. We can find uh, historic aerials to show you when a building appeared in a town or when it was not there, when it was torn down. We can find aerials. We can, There's so much stuff out there now that you can disprove things. And I can I tell a story about an example of, um, of a story? You mentioned who he's talking about is a guy named Ron Strauss. That was the, Elvis had a uh, giant airplane that he named the Lisa Marie after his daughter. And Ron Strauss was the co-pilot of this airplane. And I was fortunate enough, and Trey's fortunate enough to know Ron Strauss. And we've interviewed him. You can find those. Uh, do you have some on your channel as well? I, would, I, would I do. I have that. some okay. from an event that you hosted, Billy. Okay. And I have stuff that where I interviewed him. But Ron allowed me to take photographs of his entire logbook. He has a logbook of every single flight that he did for Elvis on the Lisa Marie. So there was a story. You and I were traveling. We were headed to Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah, and we stopped some... in uh, to pick up some furniture, a couch specifically, that, you uh, and that I bought. And we were headed to, we stopped in Roanoke, Virginia. And then we went to, I think this little town is Lynchburg, Virginia, from my memory. That's it. Yeah, it was. And I believe it's Lynchburg. And there was a story that I found where there's a restaurant in Lynchburg that claims that when Elvis was coming to do a uh, concert in Roanoke, that because of fog, 
that the plane got diverted and had to land in Lynchburg, and Elvis took a limo from Lynchburg back to Roanoke, which these are two very small towns kind of stuck in time. So first, I doubt there would be a limo available. That would be my first thing that, that my antenna went up when I heard that. But the second thing is they said that Elvis stopped to use the bathroom at their restaurant and he signed a roll of toilet paper. So I looked at the roll of toilet paper and I went, what? You know, how crazy is that? So I look at the roll of toilet paper and I have a video about this. If you go to Spa Guy and, and do Lynchburg, uh, probably toilet paper, it'll pull up. But it says Elvis Presley on it. And he literally put TCB. And you know how hard it would be to write on a roll of toilet paper with a black magic marker. The TCB is very, <laughs> the, the lightning bolt. I mean, it's like, it's so crazy that like anybody would even consider that that could be true. But the toilet paper roll made them famous. They got newspaper articles. The toilet paper roll went on tour. It went where on people were coming to look at it. Okay. <laughs> see toilet paper. Oh my God. And so anyway, so when I went there and I'm looking at this story and then I go, you know, I've got Ron's logbook. So I go to the year that they said that it happened and I look at Ron's logbook and it says that they landed in Roanoke, Virginia. So I called Ron. I said, Ron, is there a chance that you landed in Lynchburg and you wrote Roanoke in your logbook? He said, no, there's no chance. I'm a pilot. Accuracy is my, is my jam. That's what I do. So no. So that is a perfect example. But those people did it. Why? There was a motive. Okay. What, what's what's the, the motive, Trey? The motive is money. That little green thing. To get uh, people I, to come noticed, to their restaurant and spend money. And I've noticed. Elvis stopped at my place. It, money is, I guess, yeah, money is the roots of all evil, as they really, really say. Because that's lying. I mean, come on, that's you're, you're cheating people. Um, and, but see, back then, nobody had a way of saying that it didn't happen. And there was no spa guy. There was no glow trotting with Trey. And there was no, and, and the, the, the gist of the whole story is what, Billy? We don't only go into the research. We pick up our cell phones and we call the actual people that was there with that guy. Yeah. And put them on the phone and ask questions. Yeah. You know, and, we want it to be accurate. It's important that it's accurate. I'll say it again. We don't always get it right. If we don't get it right, we'll come back to you and go, hey, guys, we did not get this right. Yeah. Hey, guys, um, we passed it, passed it up, whatever you say, however you pronounce his name. And I'll bring up another little quick point about this. And, and this first episode is to just kind of give you an idea about why we are wishing cotton was a monkey as our mantra, if you will, because we're not wishing cotton was a monkey. We want to know what happened. There's a lot of people that wish cotton was a monkey. They just wish that, that the history was like they wanted it to be. So they just tell it that way. And that's not right for that other person, for their legacy. Also for us, it's not right because it creates confusion. After a while, the, mud, the water's so muddy that we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And it just creates confusion. It creates, uh, it, it's it's very frustrating from a standpoint of what Trey and I do because when we're trying to do a story and suddenly you're doing a story and you think that it's one way and then you find somebody that goes, oh no, well, I was there. So let's bring that point up. A person being at a place does not necessarily make them accurate in the story that they're telling. Now, there's people that would go, oh, yeah, well, I was there. You weren't there, so you can't know, and I can know. I would say that that is not entirely true, and the reason that I say that is that person generally is not going to 10 sources or four sources or five sources to figure out if what they're telling is accurate. And I have thought in my mind that a story in my life was one way only to find out it was completely different than my memory. So my point is, is Trey and I, when we're doing these things, we're not going to just this one person that's telling us a story. We're trying to find every single thing that we could find about that particular story and then decide what's true, what's not true. There's going to be some things we can never prove are true or not true because there's not enough evidence to overturn it, if you will. It's kind of like football. 
if they call a uh, touchdown on the field and there's not enough evidence to overturn it, it's a touchdown. Yeah, exactly. But if they call a touchdown and there's enough evidence to overturn it, it's not a touchdown. And so there's that there's a reason for that. There's a there's a point to all those kinds of things. Yeah, and um, and, and, and you know, just like what you're referring to is an event that we created. You know, but before we created that event, I discovered a story from a individual that was there that night that captured the photo and then we dug more and i discovered a same story from another person that was there that night that gave the information that put that in the theater that we discovered Mm -hmm. and that lady wrote the story in 1982 so seven years after it really happened so her memory is very fresh in 1982 and uh and she uh, got some details wrong in her story. And seven years later, she got details wrong in the story, but she got something, she had something right that really helped. And it was a, gr- a name of a grocery store that was in the mall at the theater was at where the mm-hmm. story happened. And that helps because all I had to do was go in the records and find the address of that grocery store, which put me in the building where Spy Guy and I all along said was the movie theater that Elvis Presley saw his last film at. And of course, you know, people now know what this has led to and, and stuff down well, the Some road. of these people that are listening are not going to know, but basically Elvis was notorious for renting movie theaters and watching movies. He loved to watch movies. So we thought it would be interesting. Trey thought it would be interesting uh, to find the, the the ver- the place that Elvis watched his very last movie, which was what movie, Trey? A Spy Who Loved Me, Roger Moore, James Bond. That's right. And he watched that movie at a theater called the Southbrook Four, which is a few miles down the street from Graceland. Well, there's a family member that was there that is fighting us, claiming that we're at the wrong theater. But we have eight eyewitnesses that say that it was at the theater that we say it was at. So what's interesting is he brought up uh, this lady telling her story. In her story, she mentions two other people. Those two people actually wrote a story in another book, and it puts it at that place. And recently, so, Spock, you were able to find that story, and it puts it at the place that you and I right. all along said. And right. you know, the sad part about that whole thing is, you know, Billy, I mean, we were doing this out of, out of love, respect, and we just wanted something cool for Elvis Presley fans. And the yeah. bottom line is the fans that showed up that night, they told us, man, how much they loved this evening and that it was yeah. something they'd never done before and they want to do it again. So, we'll And what he's it. talking about is 41 years to the day or 40, actually five. 45 years. Yeah. No, it's 46, wasn't it? See, here we go. <laughs> 77 to 2022. Yeah, that's 45. So uh, 45 years to the day or the night that Elvis watched the movie Spy Who Loved Me, we brought people into that exact same theater and watched the Spy Who Loved Me. And not only that, guys, we brought the fans in the back door, just like Elvis and the guys came in and we turned them right through the door that led them into the same theater. And you watched the Spy Who Loved Me on a big screen, just like Elvis Presley did, what, three days before his death? Four days. Yeah. It was, yeah, the twelfth. Four yeah. days. It'd been four days, yeah. Four days. And what's the interesting, greatest. and that would have been the morning of the twelfth, yeah. um, early, early morning. So what's interesting, and we don't want to get this podcast series is not going to be about Elvis only. We're going to touch on Elvis, but we want to touch on a lot of different history because we're interested in a lot of different history. But this is just an example of someone that claims that they were there trying to change the history of what really happened. And there's eight other people that were there that were eyewitnesses that say where it happened. And the thing is, is those eight people don't have an agenda. They don't have anything to gain or lose by where it happened at. But this person that is trying to say that it happened somewhere else does have something to gain by saying that it happened somewhere else. So that's why they're pressing on it so hard. So even in adversity, friends, even if we're going against the grain, we're going against a person in a family 
part of Elvis's family, which a person that I highly respected at one time, I don't anymore. But even if we have to go against that person um, for accuracy, I'm going to do it because history cannot be political. Right. And I don't mean in a government way political, but it can't be socially political where you're going to say something happened another way to be friends. You see right. what I'm saying? That, I'm not going to ever do that. I will never, never, never. I'm going to give it one more never. I, that's four nevers. That's a lot of nevers. Sacrifice truth for relationship ever. I will not. So if you're going to try to push me in a corner and try to make me lie to make you look better or to change the history for whatever, I'm not going to do it. And I lost friends over this. Trey lost friends over this particular thing. But we are standing on the truth because the truth is important. And Spaga, I think what it proves is that you and I will go to any length to find this truth. And if it makes us lose friends because, you know, we're just not going to just go with the flow and just let it happen. So be it. Because you and I are trying to, to get this, this human being that was just an awesome entertainer. I, his, his, his story is incredible. We're just trying to tell the story how he lived it because I believe it's important. Uh, you know, I'm not buzzing the story up. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, you know, I'm trying my best. Well, the truth will outlive us all. So if we allow a person to change what really happened and that becomes the new truth, like this movie tried, this Elvis movie tried to do, and that became the new truth and nobody sets the record straight on that then we didn't do we did a disservice to Elvis Presley or to Frank Sinatra or to Marilyn Monroe or to James Dean. And I'm not going to do that. I feel a responsibility to these people to find what happened and tell it as close to accurate as I can figure out. Hey, I agree with you 100 percent. And that's why I ride around the Great Ghost. That's why I travel to Las Vegas, California. We've been to Detroit, Michigan. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, friends, that means that we have about three minutes left. We're going to hold these podcasts to about 45 minutes because we want to make sure that uh, we don't run on, run on, run on, run on, run on for one thing. So what is our next podcast going to be about, Trey? Our next podcast, Billy, let me think. I think it should be about someone that was really iconic and has a really interesting life as well. How about, uh, how about James Dean? Because I think you and I spent a few hours in his hometown and actually hung out with somebody pretty important to his life. Yeah. So James Dean is a fascinating character. And so we'll break down and look, we're not James Dean experts. Uh, and I wouldn't even say that I'm an Elvis expert, but we've really studied that for, for years and years and years and years and years. I've been studying Elvis history since 1977 when I was 12 years old. So I know a lot about it. Trey knows a lot about it. But we are learning about some of these other people like James and, and Marilyn because we want to cover these stories and get the history out there and make it as, uh, as, as accurate as possible as we mentioned. And we owe those people that. So we traveled there. So in the next podcast, we'll talk about going there and the things that happened and how we arrived there and, and some of the very interesting things about James Dean. So we hope that y'all will uh, do that. Make sure that you go to Trey's channel, Globetrotting with Trey. Go over to TikTok as well and uh, subscribe to both of those things. Go to my TikTok and my uh, YouTube. I also have a second channel called The Weekly Spa Guy where I put one video out weekly that's just a different history subject. It could be anything. It's not necessarily even a person. A lot of times it'll be a place. And that's just kind of something that I've been doing for years and I've got hundreds of videos there. I have over 600 Elvis videos. How many do you have, Trey? I have 160. That's a bunch. <laughs> so friends, we thank y'all so much for uh, coming and listening to our first podcast. Make sure that you subscribe anywhere you're at so that you can get the future podcast. We thank you so much for supporting us. We thank you so much for coming. And Trey, 
we don't know much, but I tell you what, we do our best to get the history right. You know why? Why is that, Spy Guy? It's important. It's important. No doubt. That ending's great. <laughs>